welcome to the latest seminar at the Institute of Advanced Research and in Artificial Intelligence in Vienna. I'm David Kreil, and I have the honor of being your host today. Today's speaker is Fushin Li, Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Oregon State University. Not only has he won a competitive National Science Foundation Career Award, he is a serial winner at the Pascal Box Semantic Segmentation Challenge all the way from 2009 to 2012, and he has led his team to a leading finish in the Davis Video Segmentation Challenge 2017. His main research interests range widely from deep learning, video object segmentation, multi target tracking, and point cloud deep networks to natural language processing. Today, he will share with us his latest insights from recent work on new designs in convolutional and recurrent network architectures with applications to 3D point clouds, and he will comment on implications for uncertainty estimates and deep learning predictions, outlier detections, adversarial examples, exploration in reinforcement learning. I'm really looking forward to the talk with a personal pet interest in uncertainty uh, estimates. It's my great pleasure to introduce a kindred soul. Fushin, the floor is yours. Thank uh, David uh, to invite me. Uh, and to the uh, ERI uh, seminar today. So yeah, it's a great honor to be here today. And then uh, I'm trying to hopefully share some of our recent research in terms of uh, designs of convolutional and recurrent architectures. So all of us know that, I mean, deep learning had made great strides, so I don't really need to speak this again in all sorts of areas, uh, image classification, role play, natural language, speech recognition. There's, it, it changed the world, but it's been a while, right? Since uh, maybe ImageNet, the first AlexNet was 2012, and now we are at 2021, so it's about nine years. And then, I mean, I, I kind of feel that there is a, the, the architectures there is kind of getting a little tired. So for example, the kind of COCO benchmarks that is very popular in semantic segmentation they still cannot break like 55% uh, or something. So why is this the case? So I kind of showed a few error case, uh, kind of failure cases in this uh, uh, object instance segmentation or object detection task. So you can see that in general, uh, if you look at this image on the right, in general, it's doing a great job, but there are just <clears throat> all sorts of corner cases, there are just way too many corner cases that CNNs cannot deal with. Uh, for example, uh, CNNs are just trained to memorize its training set. Uh, of course, this is smart memorization. This is not like Kenner's neighbors, but still, if you kind of, during, uh, if during test time, you see something that is out of the range of what you can see in the training set, then uh, you have some problems. For example, this one, this one is just at an entirely different scale that you normally see toothbrushes. toothbrushes. So the CNN realized, kind of somehow believed that this is a person. It look, it just this toothbrush is just too big to be true for the CNN. And then in this case, it just, I don't know, this may actually look like a chair, but the context is just entirely, miss, uh, entirely missing. And then uh, in this case, the error that Mascar, sorry, that the data set assigns to this network is that it fails to detect the phone. I realize this is a hard problem, but uh, computer vision we have already kind of solved uh, most of the easy problems. So here we want to kind of look at detecting phones like this, and they are very small, and maybe they were not very familiar with the CN. Uh, so it was not detected. So similar problems are there in terms of uh, LSTMs. I'll actually talk about, uh, well, LSTMs are actually falling slightly out of favor right now uh, in terms uh, kind of in little of things like transformers, but we are still very interested in, in studying them because recurrent networks have a lot of nice properties such as they make online predictions, they, yeah, they, they can make prediction at each time frame, which is not true for transformers. However, we try to uh, utilize LSTMs in our tasks, such as multi-target tracking, where the goal is to track multiple persons in the video. And then it 
but so we realized that, that LSTM has problems. Like it cannot remember that the same object can adopt multiple appearances. So for example, because, uh, you, you can see this person that uh, this person 113 uh, or even this person 78, let's go with 78. 78 kind of starts here and then it starts talking with somebody and then it kind of turns around and uh, so basically at certain point it changed appearance but if you look at 113 so it starts here it kind of goes to this place it gets occluded a little bit and then this is actually 113 it just changed directions so in in tracking this is very common there's multiple appearances for each object and then now the the system kind of gets confused and then it labels 113 as a new person and it gave it a name of 101. So things like this kind of led us to believe that LSTM has issues to store uh, multiple appearances for each object when it is applied in multi-target tracking. Uh, this is probably because that LSTM has only one memory vector and each of this appearance templates is a highly complicated subject and it itself requires one vector to store. And trying to kind of mash them all into one vector might be problematic. So things like this made us to believe that if we want to kind of move forward, we would like to make some fixes on both the CNS and RN paradigms uh, that are popular in deep learning. We are not really just trying to smash this frameworks away, but rather we are just trying to make some fixes to make sure that it is, um, it, it is more widely applicable. So my research, in a nutshell, I, I'm very interested in objects. So I believe objects, I mean, you, for understanding, I mean, or for having true intelligence in some, I mean, if we could say that, uh, we would actually need to understand first, what is an object? Uh, second, like, how do you actually keep track of objects? How do you work with objects? Maybe later on, how do you grasp objects and so on? So you need to interact with objects. So we, in terms of visual understanding, you really need to understand what are objects. And objects are, is, is a concept that spans space and time. So there's the spatial part of it, right? So it spans space, but objects also moves in a video. It moves around, it, it spans space and time. So my research on objects kind of works on kind of both the space and time domain. In the spatial domain, we look at uh, reforming the CN and then kind of getting to slightly different CN models. And uh, so this would allow us to break the CN grid, which I'll kind of uh, talk a little just, just shortly after this. And that also allows us to generalize to non-camera sensors as well. Uh, you, on the, in this regard, we've been working on uh, networks uh, calling point comp and point PWC net, uh, which we published in uh, 2019 and 2020. And we'll be talking about that. So in terms of time, so we want to discover and track those objects. Discover means like from a plain video, we want to be able to um, just find out which are objects in the video. And this actually starts from just finding objects in one frame, like a single frame you think you'll realize, oh, this is the segment of an object. So for this, uh, this is some work we just published in Europe 2020, where we did a very deep variational instance segmentation. It's a very interesting work. It utilizes an FCN to directly predict object labels. So kind of re regardless of how many objects are there, uh, but uh, I wouldn't have time, uh, uh, sadly, to talk about this today. So I'll just leave this there. Uh, what I would have time to talk about is that when you, when you have discovered objects, then you want to track them so that you can kind of realize that objects appearances changes with, uh, change with time. So you can see like this person, uh, this is a judo scene. And then at the end of the scene, this person is on the ground and his, his appearance is quite different from the appearance in the beginning. And then during the middle when he's in the air, the appearance is also quite different. So, in this case, we need novel temporal models 
especially we need memory models that can uh, accommodate multiple different uh, appearance templates. So this would actually help us to kind of further utilize these memory models for kind of higher level interactions with objects and so on. So in this regard, we've been working on, uh, so for, we published uh, this paper called Bilinear LSTM you know, in ECCD 2018, which I'm gonna talk about today. And we also have some ongoing work on novel memory models that actually goes beyond LSTM. And finally, after you are, uh, after you have tracked all the objects, in order to interact them, you actually need to predict where they are going. Uh, you, well, this case, there is not much to predict because he's already on the ground. But normally, if uh, an object is move, moving, uh, you want to anticipate maybe three seconds later, where is this object? And for that, for that prediction, you would need to have a very important issue is the need to have like uncertainty estimates. You need to have proper uncertainty estimates. And this is a, another place that deep learning doesn't do very well at. Uh, because uh, as you'll see later, deep learning, even in simple classification cases, usually overestimates uncertainty. So over here, we have some uh, recent work uh, that, that kind of provides a new way to generate uncertainty estimates by, um, by kind of uh, training a, a generator of neural networks. So instead of training a neural network itself and then making it overfit, we train a generator that generates many neural networks and each of them kind of overfit in a different way so that we can use an ensemble of them to check their disagreement and then to get a real uncertainty metric. So that's, I hope I would have time to get to because uh, I have a lot of things here. So. Uh, because especially David said he would like to hear this part. So let me see if I can get there. Okay, so without further ado, let's start with the first part, uh, which is about spatial models. So in order to kind of further motivate this, uh, we show you, I show you some simple experiment that we did, which is um, uh, this, this experiment we actually did like uh, in 2017, many years ago. So we realized that CN has very poor generalization across different scales. Uh, so we start with just, just training a CN on a small version of MNIST. So we kind of downsampled MNIST to 14 by 14, 16 by 16, 18 by 18, and then we train a classifier. And then of course we train it very well. This is MNIST, we get 99% accuracy. Uh, however, if we kind of try to test it in different scales, like 28 by 28 or 56 by 56, you can see the accuracy dropping significantly, especially if you train on 16 by 16 and test on 56 by 56, we are getting an accuracy of about 9%. This is MNIST, so really it shouldn't happen, right? It's certainly not the case for human eyes. Um, the problem here is that when you are training on a small, on a small image and then trying to test on a larger image, uh, the CNN dwells on I, I, I assume most of you know what CNs are like. Uh, they dwell on like very small uh, filters. And then these filters are looking at, for example, a three by three neighborhood in the image. So if you start in the middle here, then you are kind of finding the features on all the nine points in this, uh, in this red kind of cell to compute features. However, if you train on a small image and test on a larger image, those will totally change, right? So if you still start at the same place, your neighborhood is not really capturing the same feature as in the small image. And that's why CN would generalize really badly when you significantly modify the scale. And this is not even helped by some of the work that tries to remedy this situation. Like uh, Jeff Hinton pr uh, proposed the capsules a few years ago, which did, does a really good job in handling rotation invariance, but then when it comes to scale invariance, it still cannot do it. Uh, just because this is just a fundamental difficulty of CNS because it is constrained by the filters, three by three filters. And there was also deformable CN, we also tried that, that also cannot do it. Uh, so that actually gets to just previous attempts. 
So one thing that can fix it uh, previously is spatial transformers, which actually estimated an explicit transformation. So if you have a very large image, it estimated the transformation that reduced the size of the image. And then uh, after redu reduction, then you can recognize it. And there's also deformable CNs, which is explicitly estimate offsets. So you still you start with a three by three filter grid, but then you estimate, okay, this point I should offset by this much. This point I should offset by this much. So in principle, you can fix it with those things. Uh, the difficulty with that is that when the transformation is very large, is very different from the original image. It is very hard to find a gradient that leads from the original size to the desired size. Because if you think about it, uh, 16 by 16 to 56 by 56, you're going to go directly there. I mean, usually gradient-based optimization relies on the fact that there is kind of a continuous slope that leads you there. But really, there, there isn't, because uh, in the middle, nothing really exists. You have to somehow directly go from 16 to 16 to 56 by 56. And this is really hard. So a lot of people, I mean, anecdotally have told me that they try to run spatial transformers on various um, data sets. And it just, it's just very, very hard to train it uh, because of this. So we really realized that the problem that previous methods, previous CNs are clumsy is because they have this grid. So what we really want is to break this grid, break the three by three, and then we want to compute convolution on arbitrary point sets. So that also helps us to generalize beyond cameras to also other kind of, other kind of sensors, which usually does not give you results that are kind of on a fixed grid. For example, LiDAR is very, very uh, popular in autonomous driving as well as like civil engineering construction, uh, those domains. And what LiDAR generates is this thing called point clouds, which is just a bunch of arbitrary points uh, that are in kind of arbitrary locations in the 2D or 3D space. We also worked on sonar, image, uh, sonar imaging, which is a similar case, but it's slightly different from LiDAR. And there's also possibilities to generalize tactile sensors and other things as well. So how do you do this? Um, uh, oh yeah, besides that, so if you think about a convolution in 3D, in the 3D space, it is actually pretty expensive because uh, if you think about three by three, now you have three by three by three, and then then CN in the 3D space, it's just really, really hard to build because uh, you, if you really run a dense convolution, you cannot go to a too high a resolution. You can probably go to 50 by 50 by 50 because you have to say by 50 one more time. So, so it really cannot uh, go to very high resolution. Recently, there exists sparse volumetric convolutions that works very well. However, they require very densely sampled point clouds. So if the point clouds are not very densely sampled, then your neighborhood will get you nothing. Uh, so it is still fundamentally based on three by three by three neighborhood. So uh, there's also previous work on point cloud networks, starting from this point net, which was very famous. So in point nets, they use max pooling on a neighborhood of points. So for example, you have a k nearest neighbor, nine nearest neighbors, and each of them have features. And then in point net, they use max pooling to combine these features into one feature. And then, uh, so that will kind of serve as similar to convolutions, but it is not a real convolution. It is just max pooling. Um, and we realize we don't like that. We want convolutions because uh, first, so max pooling is not powerful enough. It just takes the max. So there is like correlation structures between these neighbors that are not really captured by max pooling. And also with convolutions, we can have translation invariance which actually saves us a lot of parameters and really drove the success of CNNs in image processing or recognition. So our goal is to directly run CNNs on point cloud data. And we like to see how this works. So first we like to show this equation, which is the conventional rasterize the 3D CN. So we use the 3D space just as an illustration, but this can work in a space of any dimensions. So if you look at the normal CN uh, in the 
So you, if you are from a frequent uh, signal processing background, this will be just in the time domain. Uh, so uh, you basically, what you do in the convolution operation is you have a W. Uh, this W is based on the offset uh, that is kind of with respect to a center location. And then you have each of these Ws, you multiply W with the respective X. So the index is like if you have a center of X, I, J, K, and then you have a W at each of these delta I, delta J, delta Ks, for example, one, one, minus one, 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 and then you multiply that with X of I plus delta I, J plus delta J, K plus delta K, and then you sum it up. So this is like the conventional raster uh, CAF. Mm, so the idea here, uh, the first idea that we had, which later we realized it's not new, but uh, the first idea that we had is that we can approximate this convolution function with a neural network. So instead of trying to compute this w delta i delta j delta k, we can use a function here, which actually is the original definition of convolution itself. So we can have we can try to estimate this function of w of delta i delta j delta k. And then we know that neural networks is a universal function estimator. So we can actually use a neural network to estimate this function with the input of the offset, just say one, one, minus one. And then I would just output the convolutional weights. So with that, I can just uh, generate a convolution function from an arbitrary offset location. And hence, I'll be able to compute convolution of any arbitrary point in this 3D space. Yeah, so we actually set out to do this. And then after we submitted our first version of the paper, people pointed out that, yeah, some other people have done this uh, slightly before us. Uh, but then we, so let me, let me still kind of talk a little more here uh, of this operation. Uh, so later on, we found out that there is some place that we can contribute. But uh, before that, let me first just tell you again that, okay, in, not, in terms of approximation of this continuous convolution operator, we can use a one hidden layer neural network to estimate this W uh, function. And then we also, in terms of a Monte Carlo discretization, if you know that, we also need to kind of uh, accommodate for the density of point sampling. So if certain points, uh, if certain locations have more points sampled, then we need to discount them by dividing by the density of the points. So for that, we use kernel density estimation plus a hidden layer uh, neural network. So in principle, uh, this, the way this works is that you have these coordinates, which is, uh, so first of all, we take a neighborhood of k nearest neighbors at each point. And then for each of these k nearest neighbor, you have a coordinate, you have coordinates. And then with these coordinates, you run them through a multi-layer perceptual network. And then what they get to is that for each convolutional filter, it generates all the weights. It generates all the weights. And then you can see that we will need to generate the number of input channels times the number of output channels, this many weights. And then once we generated this many weights, we have also these input features for all the Kenyan's neighbors. And then they are also have the number of input channels. And then we need to kind of replicate them into multiple pieces. And then element wise multiply that with the coordinates and then sum them out to get output features. The problem of this approach, uh, which actually has been proposed before, is that you have to generate way too many weights. You basically have to generate uh, you have to estimate this many functions of C in times C out, the number of input channels times the number of output channels. You have to estimate this many functions. And uh, it is not only slow, but also extremely memory intensive, especially when you are computing the gradients. So what we realized is that in the end, what uh, is our contribution in our paper is that we removed this explicit generation of all the weight functions like here. So this W have K times C in input channels times output channels. Uh, this is very time consuming and memory consuming. 
what we can what we realize is that all these operations are sum or product operations. So we don't necessarily have to do them the same way. So we can actually directly go from the beginning to the end and then get rid of all this explicit generation of those very large tensors. The, the math of this is actually extremely simple in the end. It's just like, okay, you have a whole, a whole bunch of summations. You can simply just change the summation order and then move this edge to this place and move the F to this place. But by changing this summation order, you can see that uh, I didn't kind of fully explain this picture, but you can see that it is a lot simpler than the previous picture because I no longer have to generate all the Ws. Like I don't, I don't explicitly generate all the weights in the convolutional filters. However, I can directly use this uh, intermediate product that is the output from the kind of point coordinates after the first layer of multi-layer perception. I can directly use its intermediate product, multiply that with the feature, and then uh, finally run uh, another MLP multi-layer perception or one by one convolutional layer, and then I can get the convolutional results. So this simplification is actually more than 60 times more memory efficient so although the previous operation is a real convolution, it never really scales. It never really scales to a real realistic network. Uh, however, ours can because we kind of remove the explicit generation of the weights. And then now we can scale to like rest at 32, things like that, uh, instead of only like four layers in the past. And we can also, I will kind of skip this, but we can also compute uh, deconvolution uh, and also, so you can, if you are familiar with UMATS, this is also very simple with point clouds uh, because uh, down sampling points, uh, down sample like 1000 points to 500 points is a simple process. And up sampling is also a very simple process. So you can also, um, you can also kind of, uh, Kind of compute uh, downsampling, upsampling, deconvolution, uh, UMAT architecture, segmentation, stuff like this. Uh, one good thing here is that it is a real convolution. Like uh, point count is a real convolution. So if you treat, if you so it does not only apply to three D point clouds, it also kind of applies to two D images, um, which is the original motivation I had to study this problem. So if so the way you kind of think about 2D images as a point cloud is you just think each pixel is a point and then the 2D images, the 2D image, it just happens to be a point cloud where points are at regular grid locations. So 32 times 32 image, you can think about that as just about 1024 points. So you can do that and then you can treat that as a point cloud and run point count on it. And uh, you can see that with five layer point count, we can get to the same accuracy as Alex meant. And uh, also with a 19 layer point count, we can get to about the same accuracy with a VGG network, which is not true for the previous point cloud networks. They can also apply on 2D images, but they get significantly lower accuracies. So yeah, this, the point count really works on both 3D and 2D or 4D, 5D, any low dimensional Euclidean space, it would work. Uh, another thing, uh, because initially I talked about scale, is that this robustness to scale. So you can see that if we uh, kind of do a similar experiment where we train CNs on MNIST with scales of 28, 36, and 20, and then we try to generalize it outside this training uh, resolutions, we can see that Genesians kind of generalize very poorly, which is the same story we talked before. Uh, with point count, initially it actually also generated poorly, but then there are actually design choices that we can make, for example, switching Kenyon's neighbors to an Epsilon ball neighborhood, which can make point count to be almost as good as, as the training uh, resolutions, as in the training resolutions. So basically with proper design choices, we can make point count generalize to an, like unseen scales in the training, which kind of solves the fundamental problems uh, problem with the CN. 
Uh, practically, we can also run point comp on other networks on many different kind of models, like in 3D point clouds. I will kind of mostly skip through this. Uh, ScanNet is a semantic scene segmentation uh, benchmark. Uh, so we have some uh, results. Input ground truth is like here. And then predictions is very, very similar to ground truth. So you can see we got all the chairs and tables and all that. And furthermore, we can directly encode invariances because we care about invariances like rotation and scale. In, in the 3D space, uh, we can do this by utilizing um, the normal uh, vectors at two neighboring points. It will be a little bit hard to get you there, um, but just believe me that I can create an invariant coordinate frame by not using the normal x, y, z coordinate frame, but using the, the, this vector between a center and its neighbor as a base axis, and then create these two other axes, uh, axes based on the normal directions. I can create this, this coordinate frame that is actually invariant to global rotations. So based on this coordinate frame, I can get uh, rotation invariant features and scale invariant features uh, in lieu of the delta i, delta j, delta k that I used in the past. So basically, we can kind of define this uh, viewpoint invariant point call by first transforming the coordinates using the invariant transformation and then computing the w based on that, or implicitly actually compute the w based on. So with that, we can actually, we, we tried a lot of things in this recent paper that we are submitting. And we realized that the best thing to do is to create this uh, concatenated tiered structure in the input uh, that we input a lot of different features. Some of them are just not invariant, which is directly delta, delta j, delta k. Some of them are rotation and scale invariant. Some of them are generally rotation invariant. And then putting them all together, we get the best performance uh, that is better than anything else, as well as very robust to downsampling. So if you start with a 100k point cloud and then you downsample it to only 20k points, now the neighborhood really changed a lot, but the performance is only uh, affected a little bit. So with that, we can actually get to the best performance of state-of-the-art networks on point clouds in this very complicated semantic kitty benchmark, which is like real-life autonomous driving 3D teams. Hmm. So there are also other applications of point cloud I'm not going to get to today. Uh, this is going to be beyond the point cloud data that come from a LiDAR sensor or something. We recently submitted a paper where we treat different weather stations in the 3D world as different points and then apply convolutions on these different weather stations. We can treat different units in a real-time strategy game as different points and apply convolutions among them. Uh, we can apply convolutions on graph-based data as long as we can embed a graph into a low-dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, we can also compute temporal convolutions. So there's a lot of different applications of this work, and we are really actively working on it. Uh, besides that, one thing I want to mention is point matching. So if you have two frames or you have stereo, you have like you have one task, which is to match points in different frames that are just uh, at very different locations, possibly, because things move. Now, the, the tradition, I mean, not traditional, but the state of the art way of doing this is, of course, to run CNNs and then get all feature, uh, feature tensors for each image. And then what people do is they compute this thing called a cost volume. In the cost volume for each point or pixel here, it finds a bunch of neighbors in the other image. And then for each point here, they also find an, an, a bunch of neighbors in this other image. And they compute the matchings of each pixel with respect to all these other pixels in this other image. So in the end, they build a 4D cost volume, which is width times height times the neighborhood size here and then the neighborhood size there. And then this, uh, you can run convolutions on this very big tensor that to compute uh, the matching between points. This is actually the state of the art in point matching. However, this 4D tensor is pretty crazy. And then if you think about this in the 3D space, that will become a six dimensional tensor 
which is just really, really hard. And what we can do, because we have point count now, is we can discretize again this tensor into just k nearest neighbors of points in each of the point clouds. So what we can do is basically uh, we can find uh, k nearest neighbors in the first point cloud, and then we can find the k nearest neighbors in the second point cloud. I actually I should go through this very quickly, and so we never really have to compute the 4D or 6D tensor because we can just find k nearest neighbors and run point count on them to compute these matchings. So in this in this problem of non-rigid 3D matching, uh, 3D point matching, our point PWC net achieved like significantly better performance than all the previous like methods. Besides, it's it can run at 10 frames per second as well. So let me show you a quick video just to see a non-rigid matching here. So you can see that uh, purple is a point cloud and then green is another point cloud. And then when we are matching each location, you can see it's going through a different transformation because we are just computing point-wise non-rigid matching. So each point can actually go through a different motion. And then we can compute this really quickly because we have this cost volume uh, discretized to points and then we run point count on them. Yeah, so with that, I, I hope that I've shown that all the kind of potential possibilities that you can do with this point cloud convolution architecture. And then uh, with the time I have left, I'd like to go first to the temporal models. Uh, where we kind of trying to track, we were trying to track objects. Um, so as I've told, uh, tracking is, so, so this tracking by detection problem assumes that we already have detectors that detect objects at each frame. And then the goal is just to link these detections into tracks. Because we already have detections, a standard framework will to use recurrent models in this is just to first have a CNN on each detected object. So just compute, uh, assume this is an image. And then we have a CNN, and then this generates a feature vector. And the, each, each generates a feature vector. And then we will just put that through an LSTN. So that's, this is like when we presented our paper, yeah, many people uh, came to our poster and said, yeah, we tried this approach. And it didn't work. So yeah, so we just put this uh, each, basically the person feature at each frame uh, into a feature vector and then make that go through an LSTM. And then at the final testing frame, we will test all the bounding boxes and then get features for each of them and then go through this, get to this SVM and then finally predict whether this particular frame is belonging or not belonging to the track. Okay, so basically if you have a track of lens T, then you can test this on multiple different detections at time t plus one to test whether they belong or not belong to the track. Uh, however, this doesn't really work. So I, I can explain longer, but I will just tell you that it doesn't work. One of the problems here is like it, uh, a longer sequence does not seem to help. So you can see that this flat line here, almost like, okay, if you train with four frames in LSTM, you are hitting the plateau of the performance. So if you train with more than four frames, there is no further help. Why is that? As we kind of just kind of hinted to in the beginning, we kind of had this hypothesis that maybe the reason that the performance plateaus at four frames is probably because that LSTM is not really modeling multiple appearances properly. So if you think about it, it's really a hard problem for LSTM. It has this memory vector. And then now there is a new appearance vector that comes in that is significantly different from this memory vector. Remember, everything is a vector because this is, this is visual appearance. You have to represent that with a vector. You cannot represent this one dimension. So what, do, what, what should the LSTM do? LSTMs do have forget gates, but should they remember or should they forget? And so that, that's kind of a really hard question for the LSTM to answer. And we believe LSTM just stumbles upon it and then make random choices and does not work well. So what we realize is that we really need a different way of doing this by having multiple memory slots. 
here we actually draw from the intuition from like classical recursive least squares, which were used in, in numerous previous tracking work. And then uh, after some derivations, we realized that the recursive least squares have a very similar structure as RNNs because they all maintain certain amount of memory. Uh, however, there is a quite a bit of difference uh, in that recursive least squares, you actually need to store a matrix in the RNN, which is memory consuming. But if you take a low rank decomposition of that matrix, you will kind of get to something that is similar, but slightly different with LSD. In the sense that in this new formulation, your memory is this vector. And this memory vector is going to take an inner product with the feature input. This comes directly from recursive least squares, uh, which I don't want to go into the formula, but just running a low rank decomposition on this matrix. So you can have multiple memory vectors, and then you basically do an inner product between your memory vectors and the feature input. And then finally, you run another convolutional layer uh, or another really fully connected layer to combine them together. So this is basically our uh, new reformulation of LSTM in the sense that we no longer want a single memory vector, but we want a bunch of memory vectors that will do inner that will perform inner products with the new feature vector at the new time. So this this is the new detection at new time. It gets to a feature vector and then it pro, it, pro, it basically performs a matrix vector multiplication, which means each row is kind of getting an inner product this is new feature vector. So intuitively, uh, you can think about this as that our LSTM right now is not just storing a single memory vector, uh, but it is storing multiple different vectors. And then the new uh, input only has to be similar to one of them to get to, and to get to be updated or get to be recognized. And then when the new uh, input vector is going there to update the LSTM memory, because of this similarity, maybe internally, we don't really know this, but maybe internally it can only it can be only updating this particular vector instead of updating the entire, like the long memory vector in LSTM. So with this, we kind of compute compared a couple of different baselines, and then we realize this, this bilinear version that we've been proposing. Uh, we call it bilinear because there is a kind of there is linear here and then there's linear here and then we put a multiplication here. And uh, we, we, re we realize this really helps and it almost half the ID, the identity switches, which is like 113 changes its identity to 101. So that's an identity switch. So it almost half the identity switches in multi-target tracking. So it's really, it's really nice. And later on, we also kind of proposed the like new improvements of this approach by taking into account multiple other tracks and then using max pooling to put multiple other tracks together and concatenate the features. And uh, finally, we are getting towards a state of the art multi target tracker that runs uh, real time because LSTM is really fast uh, in test time. Uh, so we got comparable performance, but we run faster than any other tracker that exists. So let me show you some of these results uh, on tracking. So I'm at 45 minutes. So yeah, let's let's see this. Let's first see this result video. You can see that there's a lot of people here. Most, I mean, there are some errors still. Multi-target tracking is not a solved problem, but this is by linear LSTM. We are indeed kind of solving this pretty well, uh, but at the same time, there is all, really not much machinery on top of the LSTM. It is a really um, tracker. It just chooses uh, the detection that LSTM thinks is the best to match, uh, but it gets pretty good results. And it also works. Uh, so let me see, there's some camera motion, I think at some point. So for example, here, 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 this is uh, this like significant camera motion and it still works. And right now we have realized that, so 
we are actually still working on kind of memory models right now. And then with this idea that we always have to have multiple memory slots. But I mean, we are trying to work on this even harder problem of video optic segmentation. Uh, this is even harder because the object can deform and then you have to get each pixel right. So we have been realizing that LSTM is not really the same. And then we are sticking with multiple memory slots, but we are working on a new memory controller to solve this video object segmentation problem. So these are some of our current results, which is not totally ready yet. You can see this judo video finally. Uh, uh, we, we kind of got one arm wrong. But if you look at this one, we are kind of getting it right. And then this three pigs is also a pretty difficult video. We got uh, one, one back wrong. And then there's also this one. So yeah, this is still, uh, this haven't been submitted even yet. Uh, we are hoping to submit this paper uh, in a couple months. Uh, but we have some interesting improvements here, new memory control. So that's the second part. And then finally, I'd like to use uh, seven to eight minutes to talk about, to uh, kind of briefly talk about our uncertainty estimates, which we also believe is a very interesting new value. So this actually, so first of all, let's motivate this again. So the, the, so if you look at this image, you can see that a deep network is always overconfident. So if you look at this image, this is a three, and normally it is classified as a three. But if you just rotate this image a little bit, at some point it starts to classify as four. But the, the thing is, it, it's okay to make a mistake, but it classifies as four with 100% confidence. And that's not right. That's just not right, right? At some point, it then starts to classify this thing as eight, again, with 100% confidence. Um, this really shows that deep, deep networks overgeneralize. They generalize to way beyond what, what its training data is. Uh, so when, it is, when there is no training data in this area, it, it, just wants to, it just tends to do whatever. And somehow it's whatever is always overconfident. So how do you estimate this uncertainty correctly? There, in terms, if you think about uncertainty, you think about Bayesian machine learning. And the Bayesian idea here is that you don't have a point estimate of the function itself, but you have a Bayesian estimate in the sense that your P of, suppose you are doing classification or whatever, or regression, you will have an output of Y, where P of Y given X is an integral of P of Y given X on W, and the, the distribution of W maybe given X, uh, I might have missed the, the conditional here. And then times, uh, so integrate this over all the Ws. Okay, so the thing is now you have, you want to have a, a distribution of Ws. So this was fine if we were doing linear regression, but not many people have been doing this in deep learning where W is a deep network. So basically what we want to do is to get this Bayesian estimate by having a distribution of deep networks to compute this uh, pro probability. The interesting thing is, although each deep network may overfit very badly on outliers, suppose this area is outliers, but because the model behavior on outliers is random, so different models overfit to different classes. And then if you average them in a Bayesian way, you can actually correctly estimate the uncertainty. So that's basically the idea. Oh yeah, so the W is already supposed to be a posterior, so I, I should have that uh, given that at least. So basically this is the idea that if you have high predictive entropy, which means different models are behaving differently on outliers, that is a good indicator that you are actually uncertain, although each of this model is overfitted. So there have been several ways to get there. And the first way is train an ensemble, which is straightforward, right? You, you, you all know how to train an ensemble. You just randomly initialize a network again and again, and then you train it, but it is very slow. You, you can get five of them, uh, but if you want to get more than 10 of them, you really need a very big cluster. There's also MC dropouts and also uh, normalizing flow approaches. 
The problem with those approaches is that both empty dropout and normalizing flow, they assume some noise uh, distribution on certain things. But this is really difficult to assume in deep networks because it's too deep. It doesn't really, it doesn't really behave like a Gaussian distribution. No, really not. It really not. It's the, the difference between Gaussian distribution and deep neural networks is probably between the Everest and the, the Gulf of Mariana. And so Gaussian assumptions are just really hard to make in deep neural networks. So why do we have to do make those assumptions, right? So maybe not. One thing in uh, computer vision that we have done is to not make much assumptions about the distribution of data by using generative adversarial networks to generate, um, to generate images. You can see that we can generate pretty good images, which is very arbitrary distribution arbitrarily distributed, uh, not really kind of Gaussian distributed by any means, but we can train them with a convolutional network and then uh, uh, we can generate, sorry, we can generate those images. So basically our initial idea was like, okay, can we just use again to generate a neural network? So this actually, this means that we will give the neural network structure and then we will generate all the weights. So Suppose we have this data input right here. Uh, this data, there's convolutional layers, convolutional layers, fully tiny layers, and so on. We will just have a start from a Gaussian random sample. We we'll go to a latent space, and then we'll just generate the weights in each layer. So this was the. So there are also some specific ideas in this to make it work, but it actually worked that we can uh, successfully generate a distribution of diverse. Uh, neural network weights by using this approach, just starting from a random Gaussian noise and then train this generator. We don't train the network itself, we train the generator. We can train it on the same training loss, but instead of backpropagating through the network, it now backpropagates through the network and then goes to the generator. So finally, after training this, we can generate an arbitrary number of neural networks that happens to be uh, performing pretty similarly like interestingly like all these networks perform kind of at a very similar accuracy so if it's cfar 75 percent all these networks are around 75 percent but they perform very differently on outliers so we thought that was very interesting so yeah we tested that okay we can see that the accuracy of uh training this so-called hypergam that we call them hypergam is uh, pretty similar, but with some kind of uh, work, we can make it to be very diverse. And then uh, we can also check the results. You can see that it. so now we can sample any amount of networks. So you can see stuff in our tables like 100 network ensembles, which you don't really all see very often. Uh, so you can see that, okay, we can improve the performance by uh, making an ensemble. So this part, we also outperformed all the uh, MNF, APD, MC dropout, all these other approaches. But more importantly, we can use this to defend against outliers and adversarial examples. So in this case, uh, we kind of make a new adversarial setup by saying, okay, we have this generator, we generate an ensemble of 1,000 networks. Somehow the attacker is attacking this 1,000 networks. They generate other adversarial examples. But now, because we have a generator, we can generate another ensemble of another 1,000 networks. And maybe those adversarial examples do not fool all of them. So this would really put the burden on the attacker because normally adversarial setup puts all the burden on the network itself. And it makes it really hard to find a network that can evade all attacks. But in this setup, the attacker needs to fool all the networks and uh, and then like kind of if you know this no free lunch theorem would apply here because as an attacker it's really hard for them to fool all the possible networks that can be generated from a generator so yeah in practice we can uh, we have the i'll kind of just skip through this but uh, we easily achieve a, a more more than 97 percent of uh, defense accuracy based on this approach yeah, I think I'm about out of time. So I will just uh, quickly say that 
I, we can also use this type of generators on an LSTM model for model-based reinforcement learning, where we kind of have this LSTM model, and then we will just sample, we will just uh, generate a lot of different transition models. So we can use this approach to train a generator of state transition models. And then because now we have a lot of different state transition models, and then they all disagree, we now have an intrinsic reward because when our state transition models disagree, that means we are uncertain on this part of the state space. And because we are uncertain on this part of the state space, we should explore it. So then we can kind of direct our agent to go explore that uncertain state space. And empirically, we found that to be working better than all these other intrinsic reward uncertainty approaches, which all have restrictive assumptions on what the noise model should be. So noise should be Gaussian or something which, is, which can't be further from reality. So with now we have this implicit version of generative modeling of the uncertainty. We can model any non-parametric distributions of the noise and uh, of the uncertainty itself and much more efficiently explored and certain state space that this was published in last year's IC. So that brings me to the end of my talk. So we can, what we can see here is like through this computer vision research, like through research on real computer vision problems that are difficult, uh, we are able to gain like significant insights and based on those insights, we can reform fundamental deep learning models. So we have, we have seen that we've been working on this point conf on spatial models, bilinear LSTM and new memory controllers on temporal models, and hypergain, as well as its follow-ups on uncertainty estimates as well. So going forward, sorry, going forward, uh, there's a lot of these applications of this object-based paradigm. For example, uh, because we are working on prediction now, we can run perception-based motion planning to, for like, interactions with objects uh, and robots. We can look at video, the problem of common sense because a lot of common sense rely on the understanding of what is an object. We can work on, try to figure out, maybe try to figure out like discrete architectures, like logical structures from continuous models. We can try to do active perception as well as sensor fusion and, and so on and so on. So there's just a lot of work that can be done when we, once we have this object-based paradigm. And with that, I would like to thank all my collaborators, uh, students and colleagues from uh, Oregon State University and Georgia Tech uh, Horizon, Horizon Robotics and Neuro Institute. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much for this fascinating talk. Um, we're ready to take questions from the audience. Maybe I can I can kickstart with a few questions. I really like your approach with the hypergan and and uh, it's it's neat that you can just start with the, get the Gaussian and then get a arbitrarily complex uh, distribution in in uh, the, the weight space. I was just wondering, um, any any particular reason you're going in with the Gaussian rather than something more fat-tailed like a T or anything? I mean, would this make things more robust, perhaps, or does it not matter? It actually does matter. Thanks for that question. That that's a that's a really good question. Yeah, so there are cases in later studies. Uh, actually, in our ICML 20 paper, we didn't really start with. Uh, the, the ICML 19 paper used the Gaussian just because it's the simplest thing we can think of. Uh, the ICML 20 paper, we realized that, yeah, Gaussians are not necessarily the best. So mm -hmm. we actually used uh, some kind of Dirichlet prior uh, I in, in the ICML 20 paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, which so the difference between that is the Dirichlet prior, if you draw something from the Dirichlet prior, if you kind of do, I mean, I mean, use a specific type of Dirichlet prior, you can make it to be drawing things that are more similar to 10000. And the kind of that sparsity or kind of closer to sparsity actually helps the performance. So yeah, it does, it actually does matter. Uh, but we we still don't really fully know like what's the right prior in all the circumstances? Yeah, that, that was a great question. Okay, thank you very much.
We have a question from the uh, chat. Francesco Valo Sica is asking, um, after thanking you for your presentation, um, if an object or a person disappears for a short time from the video, will it be recognized as the same one again when it reappears? Uh, yes, we do have that. So in, in our LSTM, we, uh, if, if there is no input at a certain frame, you just have zero input to the LSTM and the LSTM just keeps going. And then once the object reappears, it can be uh, recognized as the same one. So, but okay. usually we have to set a threshold for that in a realistic tracking scenario. Usually, so I think for the moment we are setting that to 90 frames. So if you are mm -hmm. gone up to 90 frames and then reappears, we can still recognize you as the mm -hmm. same object. Uh, okay. In principle, yeah, in principle, you can just keep that LSTM memory somewhere and then you can always recognize in principle, but uh, once you get too many things tracked, it starts to get complicated. So performance does not really uh, stay that well. And also memory usage is kind of going up. He was wondering if uh, a convolution over a non-uniform grid could be a suitable way to cope with missing data, for instance, images with missing pixels. Um, I imagine there are a lot of applications. You mentioned weather stations. When you go from the satellite, often you don't see things underneath because of clouds. So could you, could you um, fill things in this way? It's possible, yeah. Uh, we haven't really tried that. And there's, I mean, completion is also a very big area right now. So mm. I, I'm sure there are a lot of other kind of very nice approaches, but uh, fundamentally it is definitely applicable to uh, images with missing data. Mm -hmm. um, you said you, you set a threshold for how, how long you remember these things. Um, maybe I can touch back uh, on, on, on the construction of, of this. You mentioned that you're looking into novel ways of doing a smarter memory controller. And that gets me back to your little blue fish slide. Um, how do you decide uh, when to forget something? Um, also, maybe in the context of the entire construction, how, how does your approach uh, attack this differently to, to the, the, the earlier grid LSTM uh, models? So in the LSTM version, we didn't really tackle it. Uh, in this version, we just made, so we actually just used the same LSTM update as before, uh, but we, we would just reshape the output. And then we, we were just hoping that LSTM figuring out its own kind of memory controlling mechanism. Okay. And it, it seems to work reasonably well. Uh, but when we are working on video objects and segmentation right now, this no longer works because uh, in video object segmentation, the mem each memory slot is not just a vector, it actually also have a spatial correspondence. So it is actually widths times heights times channels. And we, we just cannot afford the memory to let LSTM figure it out, or figure it out by itself. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what we are doing is we try to come up with different mechanisms and then we try them and uh, some of them surprisingly work better than others. <laughs> so yeah, that's, so we, we are still kind of in this process of figuring out what exactly is the best mechanism to swap things out and mm -hmm. then put things, put new things in, yeah, swap old things out. We, we, we tried a few different things. Yeah, I, I can say that the current best is a surprise that, that I don't really believe it should be the final one. <laughs> So okay. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't say it here exactly what it is, but it is kind of, yeah, very strange. So, so I, I think we are just still in the process of figuring out which would be a good memory controller method. And, and this controller mechanism is, is part of the network architecture or do you do this externally somehow? It's part of the network. Part of the network. Yeah. Okay. So basically what you, I mean, you, what you can always do is you can just take in a product between the memory and the input, and then that decides at least uh, how close this particular memory vector is to the new input. And then based on the information, you can decide that maybe, yeah, if the input, for example, like a, simpler, a simple way is like if the input is more similar to this memory vector, then you can swap this one out or you can update this one. Um, mm -hmm. But, but I guess it's, it's easy when you can update this one. It's a little harder when you need to swap something out. 
And uh, so then you have to decide which one to throw away uh, because you want to keep the memory to be a constant size. And that's, that's more of a difficult question. And that, so I think over that is the place where we are kind of stumbling. We are kind of trying different ways to swap things out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's another question from the audience um, asking whether you could expand a little bit about um, how you construct the training data for your hypergans in terms of um, starting points, initial weights, and inputs for the training. So the training data is exactly the same as your normal classification training data, or your it depends on classification or regression. So the input, for example, would be MNIST or CIFAR images, and then the output would be just classic classifications of them. So you train it almost as the, the same way as you are training a normal network, but with the difference that you are, so normally you just backpropagate to the weights of the network itself and then you're done. But now from the weights, you kind of have this additional backpropagation step to the generator. And then this generator is layer wise and then it's backpropagate to this latent uh, space. Where we actually, so in this hypergam work, we actually have a discriminator in the latent space uh, because we just don't want to deal with a discriminator in the weight space because that is very high dimensional. And then there is, we kind of followed there, there was a paper called Wasserstein autoencoders, and uh, we followed that paper. And then that paper said you can create a discriminator in the latent space, and that also works. And uh, we tried that, and it indeed kind of worked uh, but right now we are actually kind of working on some new approaches that uh, follows like real bayesian particle variational inference mm. that does not i mean GAN is more of a method that is not real bayesian it's is more like yeah it gets there <laughs> it gets there but we don't really know what distribution it is monitoring so right now we are trying to kind of use real uh, particle-based uh, variational inference methods to deal with this uh, diversity issue. So the discriminator here is also kind of used to deal with diversity. For example, if you don't have a discriminator, you could just always generate the same network all the time. And then the discriminator will be able to tell you, no, your, your mode collapsing. So you, you need to kind of have some bit of diversity and the interesting thing is like, if you do have some bit of diversity in your latent space, you can also have some bit of diversity in your output space. Very nice. Let me thank you again for, for the brilliant talk and the really interesting ideas. I very much enjoyed it. I also hope you can come and visit us in Vienna soon, as soon as virus permits. And we very much look forward to seeing you at the next installation of this. Thank you again so much, Fushin. Um, and I much hope to stay in touch. Yeah, thank you, David. Yeah, hope to stay in touch. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.